Loving Father in heaven, we are grateful this morning to be uh, at the Prophecy School. We would, uh, as we have been doing, we are once again to ask for thy Holy Spirit to come in amongst us, Lord, and write with a pen of iron the things that he has for us to learn. Lord, we want to come as the spirit of learners. We want to enter into the school of Christ, and uh, we would ask thee humbly that even though you have such material as this to work with, that you would bless us with your presence and that Jesus would be glorified. We want to pray for uh, Jeff as he brings forth the word, and uh, maybe he, he be hidden, and maybe we see Christ uh, in him, the hope of glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, we are still dealing with the first section of our prophecy school in terms of just establishing some um, principles and concepts. Uh, last night, by way of review, um, by the way, um, I introduced everyone last night except for three people who weren't here last night, um, physically here, and one person that was out of the room. Uh, the one person that was out of the room is my wife back there, Kathy, next to my granddaughter, Autumn. And then the three people that arrived last night, Alfonso Perez is in the back row. Alfonso Perez uh, handles the Future for America Spanish um, newsletter and work. He works with us. He lives right where we live in Arkansas. And he picked up Chris and Nyleve Pfeiffer, who flew in from Washington State last night, rather late, late in there here on the front row. So now everyone's been introduced. But last night in our first presentation, uh, we <clears throat> started with uh, identifying that our greatest need was for a revival, and we emphasized that um, I'm under conviction that the way the Lord intends to bring a revival to, through, to his people is through the medium of prophecy. And uh, there is always a question that is raised on this. Perhaps uh, it, it doesn't uh, stir you one way or the other, but there's always a question raised at this point. Um, and perhaps it's because um, I have an incorrect view or a partial incorrect view, or perhaps it's just because I emphasize it the wrong way, but this question comes up. I emphasize that the experience that God's people need is the experience of the righteousness of Christ, or there are many ways to portray the righteousness of Christ, justification by faith, however you're comfortable with portraying that. I emphasize that that's the experience that God's people need to be among the 144,000, receive the latter rain, proclaim the loud cry message, all the things that we're looking forward to just ahead of us here at the end of the world. That's the experience. But I emphasize that the Lord is dealing with a sleeping church and that the, the, the way that he awakens us to the truth that we do not have that experience um, is through prophecy and that prophecy is to, among other things, prophecy does many things, but among other things, wake us up to this fact that we are Laodiceans without the clo clothing of Christ's righteousness um, and all the things that are encompassed by Laodicea. And so the question usually arrives here, are you saying that the genuine um, understanding, the true understanding of the gospel, the everlasting gospel, which encompasses many things, the nature of Christ, the nature of God, the relationship of Christ uh, to the law, are you saying that that is not the message? Well, unfortunately, in some ways I am saying that, but I'm not saying, I'm, I, will, I hope to say it in such a way to agree with the truth that this is definitely directly connected, cannot be separated from the prophetic message, but in terms of what prophecy is a tool to do for a sleeping church, it's the prophetic message that the Lord uses to awaken us. But the prophetic message, I believe, um, brings the correct understanding of the everlasting gospel and produces the correct experience that we need to stand at a time when there is no intercession from sin. But in any case, that, that issue has already been raised by what I said last night, and praise the Lord, we're going to get some questions about it in our question and answer time period. We're going to deal with that. Um, so we, I know of two subjects that we're probably going to deal with already, and that's, that's good. That's the kind of dynamics that's acceptable, in my mind, in a prophecy school. Um, <clears throat> And we, t we discussed that a little bit last night. 
uh, we pointed out that uh, we have a responsibility to rightly divide the word of God and that prophecy is of no private interpretation, but that the Lord does reveal his secret unto us and the things that are revealed are for us and our children forever. Um, there is a sense uh, that uh, the three angels message is some type of tool, uh, as I understand it. We read a quote. We're going to deal with it later. It's a tool um, that allows us to understand uh, ancient prophecy. You'll see that uh, quote in your workbook. Uh, and then we read just a few of the quotes that you'll find in Inspiration where Sister White emphasizes that the foundation of Adventism is God's prophetic word. That's what it is. Ministers should present the word of God just as it reads and that word of God is the sure word of prophecy. Um, and then we looked at a place in Desire of Ages where when Christ came to the disciples on the road to Emmaus he could have performed miracles, he could have explained his divinity, uh, but the, what he did is he went back to the Old Testament and pointed out that he was the fulfillment of the prophecies because that was the strongest evidence uh, that he could give them to establish their faith. Then we did, looked at the rule of prophecy, which is the definition of prophecy. Historical events were set before the people, and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history which when you dissect it means that prophecy is portrayed upon a timeline that leads down to the end of the world and the fulfillment of prophecy is illustrated by the historical way marks that are placed upon that timeline. That's how you f illustrate the fulfillment of prophecy to people when you're sharing it to them. And those way marks that are historical fulfillments, they are also figurative, so they have a message to send to the end of the world and those waymarks have re a relationship. They, they have a bearing to one another. And a student of prophecy should come to understand not simply the historical events, but how, how they relate, what kind of bearing do they have on the other waymarks that are coming into that sequence of events. And we tried to emphasize that the Sister White says all the books of the Bible come to their end in the book of Revelation. Revelation is the, the book where... It's the target. It's, it's where we bring the rest of the prophecies down to the Bible and we use the book of Revelation as the, the, uh, the blueprint from putting, the, putting it all together in sound fashion. And of course, when we say Revelation, that means Daniel and Revelation. Uh, there, you can't separate them, even though there is some separation, so there are some distinctions. One's a sealed book, one's Revelation, but nevertheless, they are to be understood as the same testimony. Uh, we looked at the truth that the prophets were speaking more about the end of the world than the, than the days in which they lived and uh, that the prophets agree with one another. They're subject to one another. Um, and that we looked at prophecy is identified on a line. And uh, line upon line is how we're to bring prophecy together. Prophecy has a specific order. Um, some prophecies have been repeated. Uh, and we... <clears throat> I tried to emphasize that uh, we have been specifically directed by inspiration to come to understand the foundation of Adventism as set forth by the pioneers. Now, for me, that doesn't mean that everything that the pioneers came to understand was correct. I don't believe that. Um, but the majority of what the pioneers put together was sound, and even some of the things that, uh, they, that I believe they were incorrect on can very, very easily be understood um, by the fact that they were trying to bring all the prophecies to a conclusion by 1843 and then 1844 when they realized um, a mistake. So they, they, their logic of well, some of the errors they were making, their logic was still sound. And unfortunately, it seems like today in Adventism, we don't even know what their logic was. We don't even know what they were saying about uh, many, many things. And uh, that's unfortunate because that is where the foundations were established and uh, I think we should become familiar with them because we have been told that we have to um, walk in the old paths. Um, and where we did not um, get to is where we're going to begin tonight. Um, I know in your notes uh, you have section two that begins with here, but uh, the final quotes that we did not get to last night were important to get to. This is one of the rules that uh, I believe um, we need to 
set among the rules of end time Bible prophecy with the same emphasis that you would set the year day principle back in the times of William Miller. If there's a rule that we need to become familiar with, and you'll see that this is the first time that I've put PowerPoint presentations together, and the colors I've selected are not coming through well on that screen, and uh, I stand rebuked that I have a lot more of that color coming, but in any case, you have it in your workbook, and perhaps I will try to uh, change some of that before our next presentation, but from your workbook, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. And that's from John 8:17, and from John 5:31, it says, "If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true." And uh, the point being that even Christ Himself taught the rule that if He gave testimony of lo alone, it wasn't established. It takes two witnesses to establish a truth. And uh, you find this uh, you find this truth throughout the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy 19.15 says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. We need to establish truth at the end of the world. There is going to be an increase of knowledge at the end of the world, and the student of prophecy uh, doesn't want any private interpretation, but he does have the responsibility of establishing the end time truth. And per, one of the most important rules from my perspective in that is to simply take God at his word. And his word says that when we find something identified two or three times, and I think when you look at all the verses in the Bible about this rule upon the testimony of two or three, what it's teaching is upon the testimony of two a thing shall be established. And if we're willing to use that rule, uh, it'll allow us to uh, keep on the narrow path in prophetic understanding. I mean, if we don't find it a couple of places um, in Scripture, we, we need to not promote it as truth until we're certain that there is another place. But if we find it two or three times, that's one of those truths that have been given to us and our children forever. Um, Revelation 11.3 talks about the two witnesses. I will give power unto my two witnesses. Not one witness, two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. 2 Corinthians 13.1 This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And uh, there are several verses in the Bible that uphold this principle. Uh, the next one... Um, that uh, I like, I don't like that color, is Genesis 41, 32, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God. It was doubled to Pharaoh twice to establish it by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. <clears throat> so, we are going to begin now in, in the next section, which is the section called um, time Prophets, and uh, on the opening screen you've seen a quote from Desire of Ages that says, It is the voice of Christ that speaks through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam even to the closing scenes of time. From the days of Adam until Ellen White, that was the voice of Christ speaking to mankind. And... Uh, I know there's distinctions that be, need to be made between the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, um, but what those distinctions are, I think uh, some people are unbalanced in how they apply them. Uh, the Holy Spirit speaks through the spirit of prophecy uh, just as strictly and powerfully and accurately um, as it does in, in the Bible. Um, and and I, I truly believe that this is something that Seventh-day Adventists need to understand at the end of time. I mean, you'll have Seventh-day Adventists that have no problem going into the book of Revelation and saying that uh, the characteristics of the remnant is that they have the faith of Jesus and they keep the commandments of God and they can dwell a great deal upon that. But when you say that one of the characteristics is that they also have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, they don't want to dwell on that very much. But if we're going to teach that based upon those characteristics, God's people at the end of time are commandment keepers, then we ought to teach that God's people at the end of the time uphold the spirit of prophecy. Amen. 
And, and I believe that's a rule that we need to come to grip with if we're going to be students of prophecy. We have to have confidence in the spirit of prophecy in the sense that there will be light for us that comes from the spirit of prophecy. won't disagree with the Bible. I'm not suggesting that. But we have to approach it with the same reverence and uh, study attitude as we do the Bible. Um, so starting this presentation, um, Hebrews 13.8 for I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews, or that was Malachi 3.16, sorry. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. As students of prophecy... In this prophecy class this morning, what rule did we just use? <laughs> Upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. And one thing that this, these verses establish is that Jesus, God the Father, they do not change. If we can see them doing something at any point in time, we know that is something they will always do. Or, or <coughs> anyway. Now, this particular study on, that we're doing here is about the spirit of prophecy, and I wanted to insert it here in order to say one of the basic principles that we need to deal with in the study of prophecies, we have to have a correct relationship to the purpose and role of the writings of Ellen White. You have to have that just, I think, as on a working basis in order to, to come to a correct understanding of prophetic truth at the end of the world. But... This particular study also relates to a further a presentation down the road in this prophecy school. Inspiration teaches that during the Millerite time period, there was three tests. And these three tests were of such a nature that if you did not pass the first test, you were not involved with the second test. And if you did not pass the second test, you weren't involved with the third test. The first test in the time period of William Miller uh, the first angel's message was the message that William Miller brought. And if you didn't receive the message of William Miller, you flunked the first test. If you did receive the message of William Miller and entered in with the Millerites and you reached the second test, which was the second angel's message in 1842 when the organized churches closed the door of their churches to William Miller, if you didn't have the spiritual integrity at that point to say, I don't care whether the church churches close their door, I'm sticking with this message because I know it's true, then you flunked the second test and you weren't around for the third test, which came to a climax in the midnight cry and the great disappointment. It was a threefold test, the first, second, third angel's message, you don't pass the first test, you're not around with the second. If you don't pass the second, you're not around with the third. Brothers and sisters, the Millerite experience is repeated to the very letter at the end of time, and therefore, God's people have three tests at the end of time. Most of us in Adventism only know of one test. We know of the Sunday Law test. And the Sunday Law test, we will show as we go through, is the third test for Adventists at the end of time. That's where the door of probation closes. And it was on October 22, 1844, that the door of probation closed on the virgins of the Millerite time period. And 50,000 virgins on October 22, 1844, went down to 50 wise virgins and 49,950 foolish virgins continued to direct the focus of their worship to the holy place where Jesus no longer resided. That's where the door closed in Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3, in 1844, and the door closes on Adventism at the Sunday Law. And therefore, we know that there were two tests that came before October 22nd, 1844, in the Millerite time period. There will be two tests that come before the Sunday Law test for Seventh-day Adventists. We're not dealing with that study now, but I can't pass by that point uh, in this subject because Ellen White, the ministry of Ellen White, is the first, first test for Adventists at the end of the world. And this next quote is in agreement with that in that particular study, Selected Messages, Book 3, page 84. One thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first 
give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. The first mistakes for Adventists at the end of the world has to do with their relationship to the spirit of prophecy. Testimonies, Volume 5, 661. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit, which in the context of the writings of Ellen White, that is the writings of Ellen White. That's a a phrase that she uses to identify the spirit of prophecy. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. Of all the prophets from Adam down to the end of time, there was never a prophet that was being more earnestly used to speak to God's people than Ellen White. That's what that says. So, what we're going to look at here is time prophecy. There are many prophets, many prophets in the Bible, and there are different kinds of prophets. There are men prophets and women prophets. There's prophets that have uh, left written uh, testimony in the Bible. There's prophets that did not have anything written in the Bible, but we've been told their names and some of their actions. Um, but the type of prophets that we want to look at here are what I call time prophets. There may be a better way to title them. It's prophets that have a relationship to time prophecy, and not simply time prophecy, but time prophecy that has uh, a bearing on God's people. I mean, it's connected to God's people. And the distinction I'm making is this. The 1260 years of papal rule, yes, that has a, a bearing on God's people and is connected to them in the sense that, that they were persecuted. But I'm not talking about those type of time prophecies. I'm talking about time prophecies that are directly connected with God's people. Um, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. Those particular kinds of time prophecies that are dealing with God's people, uh, there is certain characteristics of those time prophecies that are always there. They're always there. And when you see them, when you see them two or three times, what does that mean? They're established. They're established. They will always be there. And so the characteristic that we're going to hopefully show to you is that there's always a proclaiming prophet that, that identifies how long the time element of the prophecy is going to take. And when the time prophecy, when the time prophecy um, is fulfilled, there is always raised up another prophet that I call a gathering prophet, simply f in the terms, that you, this is where a remnant gathers around the message of the time prophecy, and the prophets were connected with the time prophecy, and uh, this remnant believes the message connected to the time prophecy. Whatever the message is in the, the particular time prophecy, this remnant uh, understands that message as present truth unto themselves. The prophet that is raised up, their ministry is directly related to the message of that time prophecy. And, pro perhaps more important, this gathering prophet their ministry is always life or death. Always life or death. And you will find these characteristics in these uh, time prophecies that have to do with God's people. Now, another interesting thing is that you will find that the proclaiming prophet and the gathering prophet, that their names correspond to their ministry. So we'll go through and look at some of these uh, in the Bible and try to establish this, this pattern. And once we establish it, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, that will teach us that whenever we come across one of these time prophecies of this nature, we just should expect all these things um, to come into play. So, the first time prophecy, and this is the most uh, theoretically, theoretical time prophecy, is the time prophecy of Enoch. Genesis 3.6 and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There was 120 years uh, of probationary time before the flood. 
And Enoch was the one that proclaimed this time prophecy. And how did he proclaim this time prophecy? Through the name of his son. And his son's name was Methuselah. And Methuselah is what? He's the oldest man that ever died. And when did he die? He died the year of the flood. And what does that teach us? That God is long-suffering and merciful. He waited as long as he possibly could for the Antediluvians to respond to this final warning message for their day and age. But Enoch proclaimed this time prophecy through the name of his son, which when he dies, it shall come. And when he died, uh, I heard a sermon, I forget what pastor it was that was given this sermon, but it was a good sermon because he was making this same point. And he brought this thought up. I mean, there, I, he, I don't think you can find this an in inspiration. This is totally invented, but it probably is true. Is that the year he died, the year Methuselah died, who do you suppose probably gave the sermon at his funeral? Noah, probably. And what a sermon was that? He died. It's coming now. You know, there had to be a powerful, powerful funeral service because this means it's here. But in any case, Noah was the gathering prophet that was raised up. There was there also a remnant of people that were raised up that believed the flood was present truth unto themselves? Yes, not simply his sons and daughter-in-laws, but there, we know from inspiration there were people through the years that helped prepare the ark that were laid to rest before that time. But was Noah's message life or death? Yes. Now, what was Enoch's name? What does Enoch mean? Teacher. And uh, you'll see a quote here from Upward Look. Enoch was a public teacher of the truth in the age in which he lived. His name corresponded to his ministry. Uh, what does Noah mean? Noah means to rest or comfort. And in Genesis 5.29 it says, And he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Both the proclaiming prophet and the gathering prophet's name corresponds to their ministry. But for me, the most serious part is this right here. It was a life or death ministry that Noah was involved in. So, the next time prophecy in the Bible that deals with God's people is Abram. And uh, Abram set forth a time prophecy on how long the children of Israel were going to go into Egypt. And I'm saying Abram purposely. Um, in that part of his ministry, Abram here would be the proclaiming prophet. In that part of his ministry... Um, what was it that Abram was known for, according to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? He was known for his faithful worship. Wherever he moved to a new place, he would raise up an altar to the Lord, and the people around him would come to understand his God and his worship from his practices that he publicly um, partook of. And when he moved to another place, he would do the same. And Abram means the Father is exalted. It corresponded to his ministry at that time. He was exalting his heavenly father as he wandered in the land of Canaan. And there came a time when uh, in, in the process of the covenant, his name was changed to Abraham, the father of a multitude. And is Abraham the father of a multitude? Well, he's the father of the Jews. He's the spiritual father of the Christians. He's the father of Ishmael, which is 20% of the world's population today in Islam. His name corresponded to his ministry. And what was his time prophecy? His time prophecy was how long uh, the children of Israel would be in bondage in Egypt before they came out. And who was the prophet that was raised up, the gathering prophet at that time? Moses. And uh, Moses means saved out of the water, drawn out of the water. And Moses was saved out of the water as a little baby. But Moses is the prophet that the Lord used to save his people through the waters of the Red Sea. And had Moses remained faithful to the very end, Moses would have been the one that led the children of Israel through the waters of the Jordan into the Promised Land. 
his name corresponded to his ministry. When it came time to leave Egypt, was there a remnant of people that believed that message was present truth? Yes. Now, was Moses' ministry life or death? They all died in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb and the children that were underage before that experience. Testimony of two. There's two. There's many more on this, on this but that's, that's two. The next time prophecy is Jeremiah to Daniel. How long the children of, children of Israel would be in captivity in Babylon. Um, you see that in Jeremiah 29.10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Jeremiah means two things. Yahweh is exalted and Yahweh strikes. And if you read the book of Jeremiah, you will find that Jeremiah was giving the most fearful warning of all time up to that point to God's people that the Lord was about to strike them for their disobedience while at the same time exalting Christ. His ministry was twofold. His name corresponded to his ministry. And he was the proclaiming prophecy, prophet of this prophecy and how long um, the children of Israel would be in captivity in Babylon. And who does the Bible identify as the gathering prophet? Who is the prophet that understood the fulfillment of this prophecy that inspiration points out for us? Daniel, which means God is my judge. And uh, Daniel is interesting in the sense that he is both a gathering prophet and a proclaiming prophet. But was there a remnant of people that accepted the message of the hour as present truth and came out of Babylon to rebuild and restore Jerusalem? Yeah. Uh, was it a life or death message? What happened to those people that stayed in Babylon? They never walked with God's people again. And it still wasn't over. Some of the people that came out of Babylon to do that work, they wouldn't turn loose of some of the customs and women that they had picked up in Babylon, and they were cut off from God's people as well. So it was a life or death uh, message. That's, it's been established, been established before your eyes that in a time prophecy dealing with God's people, um, you should expect to see all these characteristics. So, in, as Daniel was a gathering prophet, he's also a proclaiming prophet, and Daniel, um, in, he proclaimed five different time prophecies that have to deal with God's people. Um, in the 2300 year prophecy. The first time prophecy that Daniel proclaimed was in connection with how long it would take to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The second one was how long until Messiah would appear. Uh, the third one, Messiah was going to be um, cut off in the midst of the week. The fourth one was when the probation for Israel was going to be up and they were going to be divorced from God. And of course, the one that we are leading towards is 1844. But let's take these other ones first. There, in this time period of the restoring and rebuilding Jerusalem, and you see Daniel 9.25, where this prophecy is set forth. Um, know ye therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild, to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. In this time period, identifying when Jerusalem's streets would be rebuilt and restored, there are two prophets that are raised up, Haggai and Zechariah. Haggai means one born on a feast day, and in Haggai 1-2, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying, This people, the time is not come that the Lord's house should be built. The name Haggai is emphasizing uh, a feast day. The feast days are the, the symbols of the dispensation of the gospel. And what, God, what Haggai was emphasizing is it was the time to do the work of the Lord. His name corresponded to his ministry. And there was another prophet raised up at that same time named Zechariah, which means Yah has remembered. You see the references there. One of the burdens of Zechariah throughout the Old Testament where it's dealing with Zechariah is he was often saying, Lord, remember me. 
Lord, remember me. His name corresponded to that call that's recorded in these verses. And what, what is Zechariah pointing forward to? When we think of the call in the Bible to be remembered, what is that representing? He wanted to be remembered in the judgment. He, he wanted to be one whose name was still in the book, wasn't blotted out from the book. And certainly, you can bring much inspired evidence to bear that the, the work of rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem is a type of work that takes place during the Day of Atonement at the end of the world. There's at least three places where Sister White says the work that Nehemiah and these people carried out is a symbol of the work that we do as Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world. So Zechariah's name corresponded to his work as well. Were, was, there messi was there a remnant? Yes. Their name corresponded. Was there ministry, life, or death? Go read the story again very carefully where it's recorded in the Old Testament. Those uh, men that refer, refused to turn loose of their heathen wives were sent away from Israel, no more to walk with them. Uh, those people that refused to quit selling outside the gates on Sabbath were cut off. Uh, Tobiah was thrown out of the, the sanctuary. It was life or death. What was being represented there to the message of doing this work during this time was life or death. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The next time prophecy um, takes us, and you see it also in the same verse, Daniel 9.25, takes us down to the time period of Messiah the Prince. And uh, what does Messiah mean? Anointed. The anointed. Takes us down to the baptism of Christ. Is that right? And who was the prophet that was raised up um, at this time? John. John who? The John the Baptist. We don't, know, we don't know John the Baptist as John the Revelator, do we? We know him as John the Baptist. John means Yahweh is exalted, but this was John the Baptist. His name corresponded to his ministry. What was his ministry? He was to baptize the Lord. His name corresponded to the ministry. Um, and you see John 1, 31 through 33 there. Now, was his message life or death? This is an important passage. It, it, it's longer than this. I had to uh, take some parts out. But this has a bearing on future studies in this prophecy school. So I, I, we need to take time, time to at least read this part from Early Writings 259. The next paragraph that, that isn't up there, she compares the first, second, and third angel's message in the Millerite time period with this history. That's why we're, we're taking time with this quote. She says, I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited, benefited by the teachings of Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, if a human being cannot be benefited by the teachings of Jesus, is that life or death? Yes. Life or death. So if you didn't receive the message of John the Baptist, you could not not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. His ministry was life or death. But let's read on just for, to build some foundation for a future study. Those who rejected the testimony of John the Baptist were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. Satan led on those who rejected the message of John the Baptist to go still farther, to reject and crucify Christ. In doing this, they placed themselves where they could not receive the blessing on the day of Pentecost. When, what's Pentecost prefiguring? the latter rain at the end of the world, there must be a way that we can make wrong choices that prevents us from receiving the benefits of the latter rain. And it's in this history that we can see those choices are being identified. Continuing on, the rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received, but the Jews were left in total darkness. They lost all the light which they might have had upon the plan of salvation and still trusted in their useless sacrifices and offerings who, who, what's this history pointing forward to? What we just read, that last part, what's that pointing forward to? You remember the 49,950 foolish virgins? They continued to direct their prayers to the holy place. But they were in total darkness. But there was one who began to answer their prayers. This is the same thing that happened to the Jews. They were in the same historical sequence of tests. It was the same thing was happened. Those things which have been will be repeated. The message of John the Baptist 
was life or death, his name corresponded to his ministry. Was there a remnant of people that were raised up that understood his message as present to us? Who were they? The disciples of John the Baptist. They were there baptizing with him. The next... Uh, this is unfortunate. Uh, this is okay. Next time prophecy takes us down to the midst of the week when uh, Messiah is cut off. I like, uh, at this point in this presentation, I like kind of drawing people out and make them uh, guess a little bit who's the, the gathering prophet that's raised up at the cross and PowerPoint removes that possibility. You see the answer. The prophet that's raised up at the cross is John the Revelator. Usually we get a lot of, a lot of you know, uncertainty about who was the prophet, the present truth prophet for the message of the cross. And I let people try to uh, m make some guesses to try to emphasize the point that it was John that went, the only one that went to the cross. And it was John that was given the ministry of revealing Christ, not just in the book of Revelation. If you go into the Gospel of John or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John or the book of Revelation, you'll see that the the approach that John makes in telling his story is that he is the one that has seen and heard and touched Christ. He's, his burden is to share Christ with us, to reveal Christ to us. Uh, and Revelation 1.1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant. His ministry corresponded to the name he is John the Revelator, the one that was to unveil Jesus Christ to us. John 1, 1 through 3 is, is saying the same thing. That's which from the that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The ministry of John the Revelator was to reveal Jesus Christ. Was there a remnant of people that understood the cross to be present truth? Is the story of the cross life or death? Always the same. Always the same. The next time prophecy, and this is another one. This is always a good one. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll ask it anyway. When it comes to AD 34 and uh, Israel's divorced of God, who is the prophet that's raised up? No. <laughs> good. I, I thought maybe I could get you. Paul wasn't raised up. Saul. Saul. Later to be Paul. Saul means asked of, selected, set forth. Saul was the one that was selected to do what? To, to proclaim this present truth message in AD 34. What was the present truth message? It's time to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And what does if Saul, his name there is identifying his ministry. He was selected as one born out of due time, it says in the scriptures. Later, he became Paul. And what does Paul mean? Little or small. And in 1 Corinthians, uh, let's, let's read Acts 9.15 first. Let's read both these. But the Lord said unto me, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. He was selected. He was Saul. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. There's the present truth message that he was raised up to do. And kings and the children of Israel. But you find in the writings of Paul the, the truth that made his ministry powerful. And it's, this is one example of it in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 and 9. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles. And what does Paul mean? Small or little. And Paul's power was the fact that he knew he was the least of the least the lowliest of the lowliest. I am least of the apostles that I that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Uh, Paul's the gathering prophet. 
in this time period. Was there a remnant of people that believed it was present truth to carry the gospel to the Gentiles? Raised up at that time. Was the gospel to the Gentiles life or death? Absolutely. The gospel is life or death. The gospel is life or death. So where are we leading to? Now, there, there is, uh, there's been more than once now. You, I couldn't say this for a while, but there's been more than once. Usually when, when I have opportunity to speak, I'm speaking to Seventh-day Adventists. So sometimes when you're speaking to Seventh-day Adventists, you have someone that invited you up or a pastor of the church come up and say, you know, uh, we have some non-Adventists in the audience today. <laughs> and sometimes what they're saying is, you know, I know you use a whole lot of spirit of prophecy. Can you not use any spirit of prophecy or whatever? But, but a couple times on this particular presentation, they've come up and before. I started and say, you know, is it, you're going to deal with the spirit of prophecy. Is, is this, you know, we have some non-Adventists in the audience. And, and I used to believe that this would be a good study for non-Adventists, but I never got to practice. But I've got to, I've got to do it with non-Adventists now more than once. Brothers and sisters, if you have non-Adventist friends, this is a good study. This is a good study. If you can walk them down through time prophecy and establish this pattern, and you get to 1844, I mean, you, you still have to teach them about the sanctuary. But what, this, what is this saying about 1844? It's saying that in 1844, we should expect to see a gathering prophet raised up. Also a remnant of people that believes it's present truth. And that gathering prophet's ministry is going to be what? Life or death. Life or death. And sure enough, it is. There's the, there's the very foundation of Adventism that points us to this date of 1844. Let's talk about the gathering prophet that's raised up here a little bit in terms of that we hear about in Adventism, about a lesser light. Cole Porter Ministry 125 126, the Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Little heed is given to the Bible. And the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Brothers and sisters, if we need to get to the greater light, and what leads us to the greater light is the lesser light, how important is the lesser light? Is life or death? It's not, this isn't saying that the spirit of prophecy is lesser light and we don't need it. It's not saying that at all. Which of the prophets was not lesser light in relation to Christ? They're all lesser light in relation to Christ. But in terms of prophetic testimony of all the prophets, whose voice is it? It's Christ. The lesser light is Christ. It's only lesser for one reason. Why is it lesser? It's because Christ is speaking through human beings at that point, but it's still his voice, and it's life or death. Now, in Desire of Ages 2.20, um, the prophet John was the connecting link between two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law and the apostles to the Christian dispensation. He was the lesser light, which was to be followed by the greater. This is John the Baptist. So if we're going to criticize Ellen White because she's a lesser light, then we should use the same type of criticism on John the Baptist. And no Christian would, would do that. But there's something else in here we need to pick up as we go by. She's, she says that John was the connecting link between two dispensations. And for me, sometimes I identify him as the connecting link, a connecting link prophet because of this quote. Or sometimes I will identify him as a dispensational prophet. There may be a better way to express that. Connecting link prophet, disp dispensational prophet, in my mind, they're the same thing. I use this quote to come up with those titles. If you have a better title, fine. But what do I mean by that? John the Baptist was a prophet that was used to take the focus of worship for God's people and move it from one dispensation unto another. What was the first thing that John the Baptist said when he seen Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John the Baptist was being used to take the focus of worship for God's people, which at that time was the earthly sanctuary, 
and he was to move the focus of worship from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. He was a con connecting link between two dispensations. He was a dispensational prophet. So do you, you understand the, the, the definition that I'm setting up here? Review and Herald, April 8, uh, 1873 says, Said Christ in vindication of John the Baptist, But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet. I want to add this characteristic into it as well. Um, one, of the, one of the characteristics of John the Baptist is that he was more than a prophet. Not only was John a prophet to foretell future events, but he was a child of promise filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth and was ordained of God to execute a special work as a reformer in preparing a people for the reception of Christ. The prophet John was a connecting link between two dispensations. Do you know any other connecting link dis prophets in the Word of God? Noah. What was the focus of worship before the flood for God's people? The flaming swords at the Garden of Eden was the focus of worship. Sister White's clear about that, before the flood. In fact, what's the root word of that word flaming? Shekinah. Shekinah. That was the focus of worship before the flood. And Noah was a connecting link prophet. He was a dispensational prophet. What was the first thing that Noah did after he got off the ark? He built an altar. The focus of worship went from the gates of Eden unto altars. He was a connecting link prophet. He was a dispensational prophet. That's who? Who is that? That's Noah. You, you know of another one? We'll take... Do you know of another one? We'll get, we'll get to this point real quick. Who's another connecting link prophet in the Bible? Moses. What, what was Moses used to do? He was used to take the focus of worship, which was altars, and take that focus of worship and move it where? To earthly sanctuary. Moses was a connecting link prophet. He was a dispensational prophet. Noah was the first connecting link prophet. Noah was the second. John the Baptist was the third. And in our next presentation, we'll show you the fourth connecting link dispensational prophet. We'll bring this presentation to a conclusion. And there's only four. And this group of four prophets, we haven't identified who the fourth is, but this group of four prophets, they're Noah, Moses, John the Baptist, and one other prophet, and brothers and sisters, whoever that prophet is, look at the group they're standing with. Amen. Noah, Moses, and John the Baptist. That's a, that, it's not a minor prophet. Uh, whatever they are in terms of lesser light, yes, they're a lesser light, but uh, we need to consider who they really are. They're a lesser light in relationship to Christ. Shall we uh, kneel together as far as possible? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of the spirit of prophecy. We ask that uh, you would give us uh, a love um, for your word and for the spirit of prophecy that would compel us to, to dig into the, the source of inspiration that we might be uh, fortified warriors for you at this time period in earth's history, uh, that we might uh, be intelligent in um, all things that are revealed unto us in your word. Lord, we know at the end of the world there's going to be an increase of knowledge that comes from um, these two inspired sources and we want to be among that uh, group that receives this increase of knowledge. Uh, help us uh, take any of our prejudices or preconceived ideas that we may have about inspiration and set them aside so that we can have the correct motivation as we become genuine students of prophecy at this time in earth's history. In Jesus' name. Amen.